So good afternoon, everyone. This is Bill Spaniel at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. I'm here to welcome you to the fourth FinTech conference here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and a virtual conference this time with, uh, with I believe, over close to 800 participants. So as the participants are starting to gather, let me again welcome you to the FinTech conference. We're looking for a really great two half days um, where we're going to hear from a wide range of people highly engaged in fintech and fintech where it connects with banking and a number of other things. We will explore everything from the challenges of fintech in terms of bias and discrimination and cyber risk to central bank currencies, the partnerships between fintechs and banking, as well as where, um, you know, the policymakers and those on the, uh, the leading edge in terms of working with fintech or considering fintech from a regulatory standpoint will also be joining us here. The acting comptroller, President Nestor from Cleveland, and a number of other people throughout the conversations in the panels. Um, we will also be using Slido. Um, so if you, if you're familiar with Slido, you can use it on your phone, um, or on your PC. And it will allow you to ask questions of the panelists as we go forward through this. And all this information, of course, can be found in the agenda or in the booklet, which was sent ahead of you. Um, so, again, welcome all to the FinTech Conference. We're excited to have you here. We're looking forward to two really amazing half days of, of discussion and a number of things that are coming on. Um, and we look forward to that. I see that our participants are beginning to level off, so I'll give people just a few more minutes join in um, as we do this across the, the, uh, the spectrum. So I hope things are going well for people today. Um, so let me now move on and introduce our keynote speaker. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing President Loretta Mester, who's president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Um, we have close contacts with Loretta as we share the state of Pennsylvania from a supervisory standpoint, so we're very honored to have her here today for the Philadelphia FinTech Conference. As many of you may know, um, Loretta was here as a director of research uh, at the Philadelphia Fed and I think was really responsible for establishing the Philadelphia Fed as a leader in research, particularly working through things like the Payment Card Center, our Financial Statistics Department, many of the surveys we do. Um, and many, many of the um, uh, surveys and journals that we participate in were really brought here or were visions of Loretta when she was here that we have continued. She's also continued uh, not only as the president of the Federal Reserve Cleveland, but also her academic interest is an adjunct professor at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as Wharton Financial Institution Center. Um, She's got a great area of expertise in a number of things, is well published, and has actually authored and co-authored a number of, um, uh, uh, of financial uh, research things, including topics in economics, central banking, and financial issues in, in general. Um, she's well known throughout the regulatory community and well known uh, throughout the research community as a leading thinker and a leading uh, advocate uh, for financial institutions and their key role in the economy as we move forward um, in the past. So without further ado, let me introduce Loretta to provide our keynote speech. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, that very kind introduction. And I thank the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and the other organizers for inviting me to speak at the fourth annual FinTech conference. Now I spent most of my career at the, at the Philly Fed as Bill Told you, so it's always a pleasure to participate in, in one of the Philly Fed events. Um, and since the beginning of this conference series, uh, the discussions have been consistently very topical. And I think if you look at the agenda for the next few days, it doesn't disappoint us on that score. So the conference is going to cover many of the hot issues confronting practitioners, academics, and policymakers as financial system innovation proceeds at a, at a rapid pace. Today, I'm going to spend my time discussing the implications of digitalization for financial inclusion and some steps that I think are needed to be taken um, to ensure that digitalization helps to foster inclusion rather than promote exclusion. And of course, the views I will present today are my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve System or my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. 
So it's probably best to start off with a definition of financial inclusion, and the World Bank provides us with a workable one. Financial inclusion refers to individuals and businesses having access to useful and affordable financial products and services that meet their needs and that are delivered in a responsible and sustainable way. Much of the literature measures financial inclusion as households and businesses' use of formal financial services from banks or other traditional providers, so-called mainstream financial services. With the entry of fintech providers, that definition is expanding because fintech financial services are moving into the mainstream. The World Bank's global FINDEX database provides data on how people in 140 economies across uh, access accounts make payments, save, borrow, and manage risk. And it includes data on formal and informal financial services and the use of financial technology to conduct financial transactions. The data indicate that across the globe, financial inclusion is risen. The share of adults with an account at a financial institution or through a mobile money service rose from 62% in 2014 to 69% in 2017. Nonetheless, there is still a large portion of the population that does not have access to or use financial services. As of 2017, an estimated 1.7 billion adults around the world are unbanked or underserved. Women lag behind men, the poor lag behind the wealthy, and developing economies lag behind developed economies in the shares of having formal accounts. Now in the US, the level of financial inclusion is high. 93% of adults have an account at a bank or other type of financial institution or use a mobile money service. But disparities exist. There's a 13 percentage point gap between those in the richest 60% of households and those in the poorest 40%. Federal Reserve data indicate that compared to whites, blacks and Hispanics in the US are less likely to have a bank account and more likely to rely on alternative financial services such as money orders and check cashing services. And compared to small firms who's with white ownership, those with black ownership were half as likely to have obtained financing from a bank in the past five years relying more on online lenders, which, according to the survey's respondents, provide less satisfactory service. So to address these types of gaps, many countries have set financial inclusion as a formal target. This is reasonable because numerous studies have documented the contribution of a well-functioning financial system and higher levels of financial inclusion to longer-run macroeconomic goals of output and productivity growth. On the macro level, healthy financial markets and institutions allow for more efficient allocation of capital and better monitoring and broader diversification of risk, which can enable higher levels of overall growth. At the micro level, access to savings and credit via financial intermediaries connects households and businesses to economic opportunities that would not be available otherwise. A sound financial system can spur entrepreneurship, and support the competitive forces that drive productivity in the economy. Now, in addition to these benefits, the distributional impacts of finance are worth considering. A body of work has shown that finance can expand economic opportunities for those at the bottom of the income and wealth distributions and does not merely benefit those at the top. For example, access to credit allows access to education, which can have profound effects on an individual's economic well-being. And it also allows households to build wealth through home ownership, which remains the most significant asset on many U.S. families' balance sheets. Now, digitalization, the part of this conference, uh, the focus of this conference, um, has, is transforming the financial services industry and expanding the range of financial service providers to include not only fintech lending and payments firms, but also so-called big tech firms, including technology, social media, search platform, and e-commerce companies. Now, consumer demand is one factor driving the rise in these services. eMarketer estimates that in 2019, 1.9 billion people worldwide purchased goods online. 
In 2020, despite the global pandemic, retail e-commerce sales are estimated to rise to over 3.9 trillion, and yearly sales growth has been in the 15 to 25 percent range over the past three years. As the costs of computing have declined and the demand for new services that offer speed and convenience at a lower price has risen, new firms have entered the financial services space. According to the U.S. Treasury, from 2010 to the third quarter of 2017, more than 3,300 new technology-based firms serving the financial services industry have been founded. The global market capitalization of fintech firms grew to $22 billion in 2017, 13 times what it was in 2010. Lending by these firms accounts for over 36% of personal loans in the U.S., up from under 1% in 2010. New tools and techniques, including machine learning and artificial intelligence, are now routinely being applied in finance. Like past financial innovations, digitalization holds the promise of increasing the efficiency, productivity, and inclusiveness of the financial sector, thereby increasing the economic welfare of households and businesses. For example, a wide body of research indicates that tools that increase a household savings behavior can have a substantial impact on household welfare. Digital tools that give households and small businesses at, across the income spectrum the ability to track and understand their spending and savings patterns can improve their ability to manage their finances, allow them to avoid more costly sources of credit, and increase their savings rate. There's evidence reflected in several countries' experience that access to savings accounts not only increases savings, but also in results in households shifting more of their spending to education and to healthier food. Digitalization also provides customers with tools to search for and compare financial services across various vendors to determine which is more likely to meet their specific needs. On the credit side, digital lending platforms hold the potential for more objective credit decisions, helping to guard against personal prejudices and influencing those decisions. Big tech companies have access to large amounts of data, for example, from e-commerce platforms or search engines. Models to assess credit risk based on these alternative data hold the potential to increase credit across uh, access for households and small firms that do not necessarily have a long credit history, audited financial statements, or collateral, which are traditionally used to underrate and monitor credit risk. And there is some research to back this up. A study co-authored by Jalapa Jatiani, one of the co-organizers of this conference, found that consumer loans made by Lending Club, a large fintech lending platform, reached areas with fewer bank branches and lower income borrowers. Research published by the Bank of International Settlements found that the internal credit scoring model built by and applied to small merchant customers of Mercado Libre, a large e-commerce platform in Latin America now offering financial services, has outperformed, at least in the short run, models based on credit bureau ratings and traditional borrower characteristics. And Mercado Libre was able to provide credit to merchants who would have been assessed as high risk by the credit bureau. Innovations and in payment services also hold the potential to increase include. Across the globe, there's a move towards faster cashless payment systems, which can lower costs and provide more secure transactions in cash. Early evidence from several countries shows that the move to digital payments has had a positive impact on the well-being of individuals by strengthening their ties to other financial services. There's also evidence that the use of digital payments by governments to make transfer payments to individuals can significantly reduce the cost of distribution and the amount of fraud. The Federal Reserve's FedNow service, which is currently being built, will be an around-the-clock service whereby payments can be originated, cleared, and settled within seconds. The service is expected to provide clear public benefits in the form of safety, efficiency, and accessibility of instant payments. By lowering the cost of making payments in a secure way, FedNow can help promote financial inclusion by drawing more people into the financial system. 
This service coupled with a directory service with accurate information on where to route payments for final distribution to households and businesses could also make distribution of government benefits more efficient and solve some of the challenges the government faced when distributing pandemic relief payments earlier this year. While digitalization holds a lot of promise to bring more households and businesses into the financial system, there's no guarantee this will happen. Indeed, digitalization could create more exclusion and increase disparities rather than close the gaps. But steps can be taken to help ensure that digitalization lives up to its potential. So let me discuss five of these uh, steps. First, the digital divide in the U.S. needs to close so that more people can take advantage of digital financial services. Now, among communities with a population of 100,000 or more, the city of Cleveland, where I'm from, has among the lowest home broadband access in the nation. Only about 69% of households have broadband subscriptions, compared to over 84% in the city of Philadelphia, and over 86% for the nation as a whole. Now, in the meantime, when we work on that broadband access, mobile phone technology, which has wide distribution, could significantly improve financial system access for unbanked adults. Second, steps must also be taken to improve the reach and the effectiveness of financial literacy programs. Digitalization increases the number of financial services providers and the types of services being offered. But to take advantage of these, people need to be able to access, to assess their value. One study of 188 financial literacy programs indicated that they had not on average increased financial knowledge or resulted in better financial choices. But the research also suggested that programs that included simple rules of thumb were more effective. Businesses also have to understand the costs and benefits of credit coming from a fintech firm versus a traditional banking relationship, which may prove to be more stable in an economic downturn. Increasing the ability of the consumers of financial services to evaluate new services will help ensure that these products add value. Third, in order to increase inclusion, steps must be taken to build trust between potential customers and the financial services industry. One Federal Reserve analysis indicated that one reason people do not have a transaction account is the lack of trust in financial institutions. Effective consumer protection regulations encompassing all providers of financial services would give potential customers more confidence to use the services. Trust also depends on providers of financial services adequately protecting their customers' accounts against cybersecurity breaches, fraud, and data leakage. With the changes in technology and rapid expansion of available data, the methods for protecting the data will need to adapt. The traditional way of keeping data private by taking away names or otherwise anonymizing it no longer works in a world rich with multiple data sources that can be cross-referenced to de-anonymize the data and reveal identities. New methods have to be evaluated. An example is the technique used to achieve differential privacy by carefully adding some statistical noise to the data to maintain individual privacy while maintaining statistical accuracy. And the U.S. Census Bureau plans to apply differential privacy techniques to the statistics released as part of the 2020 census. Fourth, it must be recognized that just because it's an algorithm does not mean it's immune from producing discriminatory underwriting and pricing decisions. Algorithms should be tested for bias before they're deployed. Credit and pricing models produced by algorithms through machine learning are necessarily complex because they're designed to reveal relationships in the data that are not revealed by standard modeling. But their opacity and complexity, their black box quality, make it more difficult to identify these relationships and more difficult to uncover statistical discrimination or disparate impact and to enforce fair lending laws. Well-meaning algorithms can have unintended effects. Algorithms are trained on past data that may have reflected bias decisions or may not be representative of the entire population. With more pieces of data available, there's more risk that data correlated with race or gender 
could be used in discriminatory ways. This means machine learning algorithms could exacerbate disparities by reinforcing past decisions. Chairs and Roth point out the need for what they call ethical algorithms, which are built to balance the accuracy of the model for, say, assessing credit risk with other desirable goals. For example, the developer could build the algorithm so that it has lower error rates in identifying creditworthy borrowers, and the error rate for one racial group is not disproportionately higher than that for another. At present, much of the auditing of algorithms occurs in an ad hoc way after the algorithm has been put into place and has had the opportunity to have a disparate impact. A well-known example is the Apple card. Gender discrimination was alleged by some customers about the algorithms used by Goldman Sachs, the issuer of the card, after the card was deployed. Now, who should do the testing is an open question. A report from the Brookings Institution's Artificial Intelligence and Emerging Technologies Initiative recommends that the developer test the algorithm for disparate impact. Companies that use such algorithms could engage independent third parties to evaluate them with appropriate restrictions to guard the firm's intellectual property. Regulators may also have to play a larger role in testing algorithms. Since adequate data sets are needed for testing, the rules pertaining to data collection should be reviewed. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act restricts creditors from discriminating in credit transactions against credit applicants on any prohibited basis, including race and gender. The collection of data on applicants' personal characteristics for home purchase and refinance loan transactions is required, and the data must be publicly disclosed. The Dodd-Frank Act also requires small business lenders to collect and report race and gender data to federal regulators. But for other non-mortgage loans, creditors' collection of these data is prohibited except for the creditor's own use to conduct a limited self-test of their compliance with the law. The original prohibition was based on the notion that the data might be used in discriminatory ways. But experience with the collection of mortgage data suggests that this has not been the case and that the data have made it easier to monitor compliance and enforce the law. Extending mandatory data collection of personal characteristics for non-mortgage credit applicants may allow for better testing for compliance, but it would also entail costs for creditors that could partially be passed on to borrowers. With more entities offering credit, it's time to undertake a new review of the costs and benefits of data collection for different types of non-mortgage credit. Fifth, a rethinking of the regulatory framework is needed to ensure that the financial innovations led by digitalization are a net positive. Such innovations do not reduce the need for risk management, financial regulation and supervision, and good governance, although the form each takes is likely to be different than what has been effective in the past. Existing regulatory and supervisory structures will need to adapt to keep up with the new ways that financial services are being delivered and the new players delivering them. Under the principle of it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck, a regulatory approach that shifts the focus from the type of institution offering the service to the type of activity would likely be more effective in fostering the stability of the financial system and limiting regulatory arbitrage. The extension of some regulations to new service providers is already occurring. For example, Big tech firms' payment services are subject to know your customer rules. But the entry of fintech and big tech providers of financial services also raises new issues. Data provided by big tech, data pro produced by big tech firms are what make it attractive for these firms to enter into financial services in the first place. But their ability to control the data also makes it harder for other firms to enter the market, thus limiting competition. There are different approaches to regulating data usage in order to limit the market power of big tech firm entrants and facilitate market contestability without stifling entry. Two examples are the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation and the Open Banking Regulations, which are in place in many countries. Both approaches allow certain data to be shared directly with third parties but place restrictions on the type of data and the kinds of authorizations that need to be garnered in order to allow for data sharing. The ability of big tech firms to produce 
and to capture the benefits of big data depends on network effects. Benefits to users grow when there are more users of the services, and as the number of users increases, more data are produced that can then be garnered for use by the big tech firm for the deployment of new services, pricing, and marketing. For example, a firm that may have begun as an e-commerce firm may find it beneficial to offer payment service as an adjunct to generate more e-commerce business, but the transaction data can then be used to offer more services. Once a big tech firm is well established, it becomes more difficult for other firms to enter. This adds concerns about market power to David privacy concerns. Issues of pricing, cross subsidization, product tying, and other anti-competitive practices that lead to less innovation, not more, deserve increased attention from financial services regulators. With the entry of big tech and fintech firms into financial services, the public policy approach will need to change to include a more holistic blending of financial regulation, antitrust policy, and data privacy regulation. There will need to be cooperation across these types of regulators within each country, and this may entail creating structures that allow for more formal or systematic coordination across different types of regulators. The growth of digitalization also calls for a modernization of the antitrust laws and policy, which is occurring in several countries. The global nature of the big tech firms entering financial services means that effective international coordination among regulators and supervisors through the Financial Stability Board and other international entities will be critical to ensuring that the benefits can be captured and the risk managed. Finally, it's important that regulators and those responsible for enforcing fair lending and consumer protections increase their expertise regarding the technologies being used in the marketplace. Now, this is beginning to happen as financial system regulators and supervisors are starting to use big data and data analytics to improve their own assessments of banking and financial stability risk and to understand trends in the industry more generally. Several countries have set up innovation hubs and regulatory sandboxes to encourage innovation in financial services. The Fed has been researching new technologies and innovations in financial services for some time. The system payments researchers, co-chaired by Fumiko Hayashi of the Kansas City Fed and Bob Hunt of the uh, Philadelphia Fed, are producing research on fintechs and digital currencies. The Board of Governors has set up a technology lab where researchers across the system are building and testing a range of distributed ledger uh, platforms to understand their potential benefits and trade-offs. The Boston Fed is working with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to experiment with digital currency technologies. And the New York Fed has established an innovation center in partnership with the Bank for International Settlements to identify and develop in-depth insights into critical trends and financial technology of relevance to central banks. In summary, FinTech, Big Tech, algorithms, machine learning, and digitalization are rapidly transforming the financial services industry. These innovations hold the promise of increasing financial inclusion for the benefit of individuals, businesses, and the overall macro economy. But as with past innovations, they also prevent challenges that will need to be addressed to ensure that the promised benefits are attained and risks are well managed. Thank you. Loretta, thank you for that thoughtful um, compilation of the, the possibilities and the challenges posed by FinTech, um, as well as just the broad range of efforts underway within the Federal Reserve and broader on that. So we're going to open it for questions now uh, from the audience to see what we have. Um, and one has come in where they would like to uh, to ask you about what do you think about the impact of fintech credit on potentially bank profitability or bank risk taking? And then maybe even is there a systemic risk aspect of this which we ought to be thinking of? So, Bill, as you well know, a lot of banks um, are offering services in collaboration with some of the fintech firms. So I think everyone recognizes in, in the industry that digitalization is something that they need to offer their customers. I think people want it. Uh, you know, if you just look at the demand for the services and how quickly they've risen over 
over time. I think this is where we're going. Um, and banks are adapting to it. I know the banks in the fourth district and the third district I had the opportunity to participate with an event with you all um, last month, right? I think this is the trend. In terms of financial stability issues, I do think that, you know, whenever there's a new technology, you have to, you know, step back and make sure you understand what risk, um, new risk are added. Um, and, you know, I tried to address some of those in the speech, um, in my remarks, but I do think that we have to look at that as we always do whenever there's any financial innovation. I think it holds a lot of promise, but I do think that it does mean there's challenges with it and understanding those risks I think are important. The big tech firms in particular, how you think about them and how you think about innovation and competition, um, I think is something that's on the agenda for a lot of the regulators. And I would say the Financial Stability Board um, has FinTech as one of their focuses in their work program for this year, and I'm, I'm sure it will continue on their program for next year. So there are risks, but without, you know, there's risk of stand, trying to stand still as well. And I think people demand the services. We're going to figure out the right way to provide them while maintaining the health of the industry and the, making sure the financial system is stable. So, Loretta, to that point, and you made your point in your speech about how, uh, you know, with mortgage data and Humda data, transparency actually helped to promote better understanding and better compliance. A similar question on the fintech side. What what might you think are approaches to fintech re regulation that would balance, as you mentioned, the, the need for consumer protection and privacy, as well as credit access across even a broader scope of people uh, who maybe do not have credit at this time. It's, it's a hard balancing act. So your thoughts on how to, you know, thread the needle, so to speak. So there are regulations that are on the books now, right, that really apply a cost, right? So this refocusing things from institutions to the actual activity, I think, is promising, right? We don't, we, you know, the mortgage, you know, HMDA, you know, that's enforced by the Consumer Protection Bureau, right? That's about a mortgage offer, whether you're FinTech or whatever, right? So thinking about what the activity is rather than focusing on the entity, I think is promising. And we have that already in some of the regulations. We don't have it in all, but we have it in some. And I think that would be the approach, given there is a plethora of new entrants um, of different types of firms. We want to make sure that we're focusing on, on activities and not focusing on entities, because then you get these these regulatory arbitrage opportunities, which I think make the system less, um, you know, more risk of financial instability that, rather than less. So that would be the approach I would take. On the data per se and the transparency, again, as you said, Bill, there is a balance here. Um, and I think a review of the costs and benefits is in order. As you probably well know, the Fed had twice in the 90s um, put out for public comment proposals to relax some of the prohibitions against data gathering because of the experience with Honda suggested that that actually might be beneficial in terms of uh, a, a wider, fairer access to credit. Um, neither of those attempts uh, went forward as proposed. Now, they, that was about voluntary collection as opposed to mandatory collection, and that matters. But I do think that looking at that again um, across different types of credit instruments would probably be a thing that you could undertake now um, so that you could think about the costs and benefits in a more systematic way. So thank you, Loretta. This question uh, in next goes to what, um, and, and perhaps even digital currencies play a role here, but what, what do you think is the relationship uh, or the potential relationship between the rise of fintech and big ten and the, the actual transmission of monetary policy? Well, that's a big, that's a big <laughs> important question. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that is on the agenda for the Fed in the various fintech hubs that we set up is digital currency and thinking about the implications of that for transmission and monetary policy. Uh, it's a, broad, it's a really broad question. And I think that it's going to depend on, on the country. So if you look at the various countries that have, you know, 
projects underway about digital currency, there are different motivations for them. In some countries like Sweden, one of the motivations was because the demand for cash is so low, right, that digital currency and, and central bank digital currency might make more sense for them because of the transmission mechanism. In other countries, it, it is to uh, support financial inclusion, like Uruguay in particular was interested in central bank digital currency as a way of expanding financial inclusion. In the U.S., you know, demand for cash is still very high, um, and the demand for accounts is still high. So the cost versus benefits here of central bank issued digital currencies are going to be different. But I do think before you'd introduce it, you would want to think through how will it affect the transmission mechanism. I don't think it would necessarily negatively affect it, but I think it might be transforming. And I think thinking through what those what that transformation would look like would be important within the U.S. financial system and the global economy as well. Thank you, Loretta. So let, let me wrap up with this question, which uh, people are asking you to put on your or to use your crystal ball a bit here, uh, I suspect. Um, but but as you did point out, you know, the, the, a large proportion of some traditional banking activities are being performed by fintech. Um, I think you mentioned around a third of the personal loans were now provided by fintechs in the U.S. So uh, the question is asking you if you could project forward to 2030, um, which I think this is a tough question, but we'll let you finish with this one. You know, what, what, how would you see the, the banking landscaping changing or, or in, in what fashion do you think it's most likely to change? Well, well, Bill, you're probably in a better position than that question than I am. Um, so, and I left my crystal ball in my other uh, jacket over there. So, anyway, I mean, I think if you just think broadly about technology, right? Technology and the economies of scale that are um, fostered by technology mean that, right? Institutions are going to get larger. I don't necessarily think that it necessarily means that banking will be dominated by fintech firms, but it does suggest that to capture the benefits of technology, firms are going to have to get larger. Does that mean that there won't be a place for relationship lending? No. I think relationship lending is here to stay, and I think that it can be done in maybe more efficient ways using technology and using these, you know, models that in, involve more data than the traditional underwriting data that are used currently. So I think it's more of a transformation of how you do things than necessarily what entity is doing it. And I think banks are moving in that direction now in terms of their use of technology. But we'll see. We'll see what happens, Bill. So, Loretta, again, thank you so much for taking the time today um, to address the group. We really appreciate your thoughts. And actually, your, your thoughts you know, are very thoughtful and, and, and very um, comprehensive in terms of the issues we will face and what we need to go forward and how we need to be thoughtful. So I, I actually uh, it encourages me to say that, you know, the central bank and the Federal Reserve are in good hands with presidents like you and others. So thank you for your, for your service. Well, thank All you. right. We, you're welcome. We will be.